Sean, the design director, and this is my officers. Yeah, I'm Victor. Hello, I'm Luke. I'm Chase. And we're here to welcome you into the design workshop. This will be our first one for this quarter, and we will be teaching you what is game design, and you know what we kind of do, what role you might play if you get put into a team as a game design. Uh, do you have any questions before we start? Cool. So, what do designers do? And what is our job on a game team? Um, so, just curious if any one of you um, wants to like kind of say what you think a game designer does on a game project, just go ahead and shout it out. Build levels. Build levels. Define mechanics. Define mechanics. Yep, so all of that is correct. Uh, we game designers are in charge of, you know, what, what the level looks like and what mechanics would be in our game. Um, because what a game designer does is they craft the player experience and they create levels or create mechanics and even other things like how does the movement work or what does the UI look like, making sure like the player is like, you know, comfortable playing the game and you're given the experience that you are intending to. Uh, I think it's helpful to compare to other departments. Um, like art makes the game look good. Uh, sound design makes the game sound good. Designers kind of make the game feel good to the player. Um, and of course, good is subjective. Like it depends right. on the game. Like you know, the way Dark Souls is good is definitely different from the way Mario is good. So when we say good, it's more of like the intended experience. Yeah, good is good is defined by yeah like the intended player experience the pillars of your game right because like Mario is very easy but there are a lot of people that find it fun Dark Souls is very hard but there are people that find it fun so it's defined by kind of your target audience as well as uh, the specific experience that you're trying to capture. So any thoughts on that? Anything that you maybe want to like ask us, like maybe if you're thinking of what a designer might be doing and you, you're not too sure, you can ask. Because um, a designer does actually quite a lot for a team. Like they could fill a lot of roles for a game team. So it's kind of like it might be a little bit harder to answer this question for some people, just because like designers just feel like they're doing like a lot of stuff, and so there's no real specifics as to what they do. Uh, is this actually same as like the? in the movie, like the director? Mm, sort of. Uh, it's not exactly like a director, because um, like a director's job is kind of like making sure everything is placed in a specific way, and like are the camera shots perfect and all that. Um, if you're like a team lead, maybe, or like a lead designer, you might fill the role of a director, but uh, you want to So the roles of the designer and writer both of those roles kind of come from, if you're comparing it to like movies, both come from like a writer job. So it's your job to like get the mechanics behind the film and everything else to get it to work in a nice way. So like writer, the idea of writer splits into two things. Because not only are we nurturing someone's experience through the dialogue and what's happening and how stuff moves, we're also nurturing their experience by how they interact with the world. So it splits off into what the world is pushing towards you, which is a little bit more writer-based, though also designer-based, and what you are interacting with the world, which is designer. So we we nourish how the player interacts with the world. And if that answers your question. Um, any other questions, thoughts? All right, so next slide. Uh, what are the specializations of game design? We kind of delve into it a little bit. We talked about like level designers, possibly like system designers and UI designers. Um, but there's a lot of fields as you can see down here. Um, so like as we mentioned before, like a designer can do a lot of stuff just because there's so many like fields that a designer can fill for a game project. Um, so like we have some examples. We mentioned systems, level. There's also narrative designers. That's kind of like similar to the like the writer role, like how they're like building the world into like. Um, how the story is told to the player and how it affects their experience. Um, yeah, this is a lot. So when you become a designer on a project, there are many different kind of roles you can fulfill for a game project to make it uh, play well and play you know, good. I believe in the industry, um, people tend to be more, what's the word, specialized? Yes. So individual designers will have will be more specialized in one of those categories. But in the club, you only have 
design here for a specific role in the project. This was about the scope of our projects. But uh, yeah, in the, in, in the industry, there would be specialization. Also, some people in other projects might work on and fulfill aspects that normally a designer would be, like UI design. Usually, they have a specific designer to do the UI design that you had on the people. But in like a smaller group, the programmer who's the building the UI and programming how it works might also just design it as well. I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that kind of the ones that we focus on within the club, uh, like primar primarily focus, are level design and gameplay design. So obviously designing levels, and then also designing mechanics specifically. Um, obviously all of those roles kind of get filled within a team, but within our workshops we primarily cover those, I think. Of course, there are other roles that we didn't mention here that can like, kind of bleed into other fields. So if, you, if you're in this workshop and you happen to see yourself maybe more of an artist, there's character designing and you know like learning like color theory to help your team design. If you're more of a programmer, you might be more of a technical designer and you're like more technical code and um, kind of figuring out how to talk to both the programmers and designers on your team. So there's a lot of ways to like kind of bleed into other fields as well. anyone have like any specific uh, specializations that might not be here but you might see yourself interested in? How about like a designer for like let's say a game has um, like enemies mm -hmm. so there's a designer for designing enemies and bosses and the mechanics for those enemies and bosses? Yeah there would there could be. Um, is that an actual category or is that does that fall under gameplay? It, it, it probably depends on the type of game you're playing. I know oh, okay. some games or building I know some games like Dark Souls, there's guys who actually their job is to like build a boss or build an encounter. Uh -huh. So depending on the situation, that might fall into level designer or it also might fall into, hey, your job is actually to make good bosses. Oh so okay. Design, right? Yeah. There are encounter designers in the industry. Um, so that is that is another field that we can have on here that what was it? encounter design. Encounter design. Mm -hmm. Oh okay. Like, One thing that I did want to kind of mention, just to give like a tangible example of kind of how things bleed together. Um, last year during Game Developers Week, uh, we had one of the uh, quest designers, environmental designers from World of Warcraft come and speak. And he was talking about how um, his, his role is both to physically craft the environment, so moving vertices to create the, the world, but also to kind of think about what quests are going to be going on there and even to design some of those quests. So he kind of, his role kind of led, and he was there from the beginning, so I'm sure that now a lot of those roles are kind of split apart and diversified, but at least at the beginning of the game's development, it was, he was doing like that, that spectrum of work. So a lot of, a lot of design, if you're not personally doing a lot of things, then a lot of people are collaborating constantly to make sure that the um, player experience is fluid and that it meshes well between the different aspects. Mm -hmm. um, what are the goals of game design? And what do we consider a good or well-designed game? Sure. Um, as, as you'll discover throughout these workshops, the word fun means nothing. <laughs> um, really? It is completely subjective. Uh, I think that we kind of touched on it. Uh, it depends entirely on your target audience and the, we'll talk about like being pillars, but like the, the core concepts that your game is designed around. I think it's like fairly simple. Just think of two games with very, very distinct mechanics, and then try to figure out why you enjoy those two different games. Like I really enjoy Dark Souls, which, and the reason I enjoy it is because it gets me into this flow state, and it, I get into the situation where I'm just playing along. And so, like, it's good design getting the people into the flow state where they're just going along and they react to all the things coming to them, and they're just reactionary 
gameplay, or is it in another game that I like, which is like Civilization VI or Into the Breach, where you're planning out stages ahead, and you're figuring out where things go, and you're strategizing a lot of times. They're both well-designed games, but they're the aspect of game design that they're focusing on is very distinct for both of them. And like these games, they would all kind of like, they have a goal in mind, which typically is like a pillar of your game, as you kind of touched on briefly, where it's like, what does the game want to give the player? Like, why is the player playing this game? What should they interact with it? So you mentioned Dark Souls a lot. Like, what does Dark Souls give to the player? <laughs> that is a fair one. Um, so yeah, like the whole idea of Dark Souls, in, in my opinion, is like the game is difficult, but to the point where it's not impossible. Like they want like that feeling of catharsis where the player is just getting destroyed by the um, AI in the world, and they're just like, man, I really want to destroy these things, and when they do, they like feel amazing because it's just that feeling. Of Talk about the Dark Souls club. I, I, I play the Dark Souls. So I just realized, like, uh, so during like you play in the Dark Souls, and uh, you, even though you like beat by the enemy in the during the middle of the map, and you can still sometimes you can open some shortcut, and and let you like, uh, I, I mean, go through to the boss easier than the than the last time. So I just wonder, like, what kind. Of like specialization, like uh, in the game design uh, for this one. I'm pretty sure that would be level design. Level design. Okay. Yeah, uh, especially if there's like the idea of like shortcuts and like creating multiple paths towards multiple areas. That sounds like a good job for someone who's like creating the world inside of like a game engine and kind of like figuring out like where could the player go and where could they go. And I think that kind of getting into the philosophy of like why is that good, you know. What, what makes that a good thing for this game? What makes that game, th that decision, a good design decision, right? Uh, it's kind of, you gotta put it into this perspective of, you know, <coughs> what are you rewarding the player with versus how are you punishing them? Um, and that's, I think that's a, its own workshop is reward and punishment. Yeah. Um, so I can't obviously summarize that in a few sentences, but, um, the idea that you get to a certain checkpoint, so to speak, and then you can get back, back to that point easier, you're rewarding the player for doing well in the game by allowing them to progress faster, essentially, to get that shortcut, you know? Yeah, so I was just curious about something. Um, when, like, early in the workshop, you guys mentioned how kind of like when game designers, they make the game how they want to define the design for their game. Uh, one thing I heard was like, you want to make it towards the target audience, but as Chase said, it was kind of like fun. It should not be made like, oh, just to make it fun. So one thing I'm confused about is when designing a game, do we want to focus on making it for specific tar target audience, actually making the game good for what we, for what it's supposed to be like, you know, if it was a, you know, a puzzle game, we make it so it's a puzzle game or a little bit of both, like a balance between both? Uh, I mean, I hate to say this, but it kind of just, it sounds like a, like a dependence on oh, like, okay. what the game design is. Because like multiple mm -hmm. games will have like multiple, like fit those kind of different genres inside the same place. Like if I gave you, for instance, Bejeweled, like that game is primarily puzzle game. It's yeah. pretty hard to say otherwise. But something like Uncharted has like a mix of exploration, combat, and mm -hmm. puzzles. So like they use a mix of everything it kind of like helps them with the game flow. So like the player is constantly like in different pieces of the game so they're not like stressed or bored. Right. So it's kind of like, it really does kind of depend on what your design goals are for the player and like what kind of experience as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, like the, the, the kind of genres or the kind of audiences that you're targeting is like kind of like what you're designing around. Right. So some games will design for a broader audience, some will design for a much smaller audience, some will put multiple genres in their game, and some will just stick to one. But do you use, but do you use like a target audience as like a platform to decide on what would make the game good for them and then work later on towards, oh, okay, if you wanted to um, make other people like the game, maybe people who are not a fan of this genre, how can we do that, right? So you use the target audience kind of like as a base and it work off from there. Yeah. Okay. There, there are kind of two sides to the same coin. Um, what is your target audience uh -huh. and what is the player experience that you're trying to evoke? Okay. Right. Um, those those two things are basically inseparable, they go hand in hand. Oh. Okay. Um, and you can look at it from either perspective. What kind of people am I designing for? Am I designing for people who enjoy challenge, who are looking for action, who uh, you know thrive on the idea of overcoming difficulty? I'm going to make dark souls, right? Um, alternatively, if you're looking at you know I want to make a game that is difficult but able to be overcome. I want to make a game that is challenging, but I want to find the, the fun in the challenge, right? Yeah. Um, that will still lead you to the same game, but you're looking at it from a different perspective, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of, they're, they're one and the same. Okay, makes sense. very meticulous or like just be very um, specific at least like design like make everything very like down to the detail of what it's supposed to be okay yeah yes. persistence persistence okay yeah I would say two big ones is the breadth of your experiences with games the more games you've played and mechanics you've seen the more you can draw from different ones that were successful and mix them together and the other one I would say is really important is empathy can project yourself into what the player is experiencing at that particular moment in your game. You can kind of figure out what it looks like from the other end, which allows you to design mechanics that will achieve your vision. How about consistency? consistency. What about like a car? Like what if I'm making a, a game about, um, I don't know, racing? Do you think it'd be good to like designing cars? Designing cars? Yeah, like nothing fancy or specific, just, you know. So just like, like Fields like no, knowing other fields of like uh, studies. I don't know. Like I'm thinking, if I'm defending a game that has racing cars in it, so then I know how a car looks like. I don't know. So that depends on the type of car game you're designing. Because if you're designing those car games that they come out with a ton now, where it's like super detailed and this is exactly how a car interacts in this situation, then yes. But if you're designing the car that game I made like a couple of years ago, Spiral Trip, that has nothing to do with cars whatsoever. Still, you're designing a car. From technical limitations. Technical limitations. Okay. These are all correct, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> 
no one said anything wrong yet. Yeah. We'll let you know. Yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> are you supposed to uh, scope the game down? That, that I want to say no, just because that sounds more of like a producer. Okay. Although knowing scope definitely helps. Like understanding if your game is out of scope or not would definitely help you as a designer. How, how would that help? How many times? Um, because if you create a game with the assumption that everything you design is going to be in it, you might start seeing it break once things have to be taken out. So if you create too many dependencies, that can cause issues if your project is going into crunch mode. So like if you have like 100 things you need, but only like 50 of them can make it, if those other 50 are needed to make the experience work, then you're going to see some problems. I think it's not, it's not so much knowing what, not necessarily knowing like what if your game is going to be entirely in scope, but rather what is the most, what is the best mechanics to cut if it is out of scope. Knowing where to make those decisions. I think back to uh, my first project here, um, Base 6, where you know I was one of two designers on the team and I wanted, you know, like six different dungeons where each one focused on a different aspect of the player's abilities. Um, and like two weeks in, we were like, no, that's not going to work. Um, and so Question. instead, Thank you. I, we cut the number of dungeons but still kept the idea that the dungeons were going to have focus on specific player abilities and it still got the same point across okay. of Thanks. Thanks. you know allowing the player to exercise the abilities that we've given them um, it still it still kept the core feel of the game without having as much in it as I wanted I, I also think it's important that even if you have the assumption which no one ever does of infinite time and resources to do every single design idea that goes into your head you can get that made, you have all enough resources and time to do that, it's still a good idea to look at your game and go, what are the core aspects of it that make this game very enjoyable? And once you know those, then you can build on those and you can bring it down to that because you just want to find what do I absolutely, what is the best part of this game? And then build from there. Yes. I don't know if this sounds more like writing, but does the pace, does understanding how pacing works in a game also matter when it comes to design? Like, like you don't want a game, like you play a game, you don't want it to drag, to drag across the floor. Like, a, you don't want a player to feel like, oh, this is dragging along. But I feel like that's more story, but could it also be in design as well? That sounds like an entire workshop. That sounds, that sounds like <laughs> Oh, a I'm sorry. Flow. Yeah, that's game flow. I'm sorry. Like the idea of like flow, like if, if anyone ever see that like flow graph. Yeah. Like anxiety versus boredom, it's like that. Oh, okay. Yeah, you want to hit the sweet spot between, you know, overwhelming the player and having the player being completely bored. Like, there's a kind of like a channel in between oh, those okay. that, that, that's called the flow state. And yes, the idea of you don't want things to be boring for the player, you want the player to feel overwhelmed. And if I, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't that like adapted from like entertainment theory or something? Or was that something else? I'm not familiar with that. Right. Sure. I was just wondering. I didn't. <laughs> but no, you're, you're correct. Oh, okay. He's from psychology. Yeah. She gets me hyped. The one who wrote the original book. There we go. Yeah. Um, interesting. I haven't heard this one from the crowd, but uh, listening. Uh, that is an important skill as a designer. And uh, it's funny because it's actually inside of a book called The Art of Game Design. I believe Jesse Schell claims it's like the most important skill a designer can have is listening above all else. Because uh, as you'll find out in the club, unless you're designing a game by yourself, you're most likely going to be talking to other people. Programmers, artists, audio people. You also have to listen to playtests as well. Right, you also have to listen to playtesting. So, so uh, you're going to have to like talk to all these different disciplines, even like your testers. And so, like being a designer who knows how to listen is also very important. And, yeah. Everything you're going to make is going to be the best first try, you always want to reiterate on it, and having other people to talk to and listen to definitely helps you improve what you're making. Yeah, I think kind of building off of perseverance, it's important to kind of have thick skin and yeah. not 
not be so partial to this, like, oh, I have this great idea, and then it's, you implement it, and it's exactly how you want it, and you test it on a bunch of people, and everyone hates it. Like, that hurts, but you have to kind of just, you know, suck it up and, all right, my, my idea wasn't good. Let's move on, you know? If you're designing a game for so yourself, oh, yeah. If you're designing a game for yourself, then you know, do what you want. But well, yeah. most of the time when you're a game, a game designer, you're going to be designing games for other people. So it's important that, like, the game you create, like, takes in feedback from those who are playing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you guys talking about listening, right? That's very important. So I'm wondering, like, if you work, like, in a game studio, right, and you have a supervisor who's the one who pays you your salary, right? And you know, you, you want to keep them happy, right? And then let's say they just bring like an absolutely like outrageous idea, like we're gonna make, I don't know, Overwatch, but it's gonna be royale, and it's gonna have all this crazy stuff, and it's gonna be so cool. So you have to listen to them, right? But like, like who has the saying in their life? Because they are, they are the ones that are in power. But you as a designer also is the one who's in charge. Like, I guess, I don't know. How, how does this listening interact in, in that type of environment? In this okay, so country? I have no experience in the job industry, but I would consider probably talking to your supervisor and telling them why it's a bad idea. If your supervisor isn't someone agreeable, then I don't know, man. It's, uh, you have more experience in that than probably the rest of us. So uh, yeah, I don't, I can't speak from experience either. Um, but if I if I were in that scenario, it would definitely be a good idea to have a conversation with them okay. and possibly like the other you know team members because you know if you want to make overwatch royale you're gonna have to talk to your network engineers your artists your like designers and programmers and they all have to probably have a say in what's going to happen if they are going to also be on this project um so yeah it's all like it's kind of like a mix of like teams like speaking within the team and like problem solving um, or, yeah or if you don't mind my my input, for what I know, it's like, as I remember, um, I have a friend who works in the industry, right? And he, uh, he talked about how, um, like, and I guess this, this goes to what you guys are saying, that because people have the, concept, the misconception that designers are the ones who come with their ideas, right? Mm -hmm. But it's more like you're saying that the designers are the ones who listen to everybody's ideas and put them together? Right. Because for what I know uh, from my friend, he said that um, when they're planning, when they're working in a game, they actually bring everybody together. They have like the programmer, the producers, the artists, and they'll talk about what game they're gonna build and for what purpose. But then it seems like, for what he says, the designer will always do like the last, um, the last saying, because the designer is the one who knows the system the most. Because like in this in this particular scenario, they were working a new game and they already had ten other games made, and all these games were um, they were like card games, but they were like similar type of games, I guess. So nobody knows these games more than the designer when it comes to the system. So it's like, like I, I will see like the, the people who will have like an idea and will say, oh, we should do this. And the designer will say, no. But like he will say why. Like he will say, this specific system won't work because we have this other game in which we did something similar and it didn't happen. So to me, it felt like the designer has the last saying because they have like a history of all the things that they have tried so far and they can like, I don't know, something about like, Documentation, right? Like, I don't know if is that a skill that we need because I don't think we have to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Good writing skills is always good as a designer. But uh, I guess if I'm listening to this point, of course, um, that the designer has the last say in decisions. Is that right? Like, that's what you're saying? Yeah. That sounds like it's very, like, okay. team. Like, I, I would have to know the context of the team because, uh, I like, it's. Sometimes you do have to say no as a designer. Like sometimes something just sounds like it will not work no matter what. And it's just you cannot implement in any way. It's just something to be careful of if you're working in a team because it just sounds like one of those like try not to be that guy kind of scenarios where you're just constantly saying no because it doesn't appear what you want. I guess like instead of listening, it's more like communication skills. Minus. Like yeah. I guess to, to put it more to the club, right? Like if I'm working on a team, and I went to, I don't know, like I'm talking to a designer and I say, hey, we should have this idea. And, my, and the designer just says no to me. That kind of feels bad for me, you know? I don't know, it feels like right. they're just throwing away my idea. So I guess if a designer is able to explain to me, oh, like, you know, that, that's a great idea, you know? And it might work, but, you know, it, it's not gonna work in this scenario because of A and B reasons. I don't know, like, what do you think? Or you could go, that's a great idea, that might work, but how would we 
fit, fit that into our current system that we already have? How would that fit into what we currently have? And if you could figure out how it fit into it, you would, instead of just saying flat out <coughs> no, you would walk them through the thought process that you have into the back of your mind of, okay, here's how this fails, and you just say, okay, and ask all the questions you're asking yourself, but it eventually gets you to the result where it doesn't fit, and then you just talk them through that part. And what you're saying is that VGBC designers in a team are not gods who have the whole saying of what the game should be. No, I don't think anyone in a team of six has an absolute say on what the game should be. All right, uh, that's good enough. I think just like more like the umbrella term of like just people skills. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my question is just more about like building off of his question, is the job of a designer to like, like can a great designer make a, a good game out of a bad idea? Or is the job of a designer also to make ideas themselves? Um, well, the designer definitely has, like, is definitely the one who's come up with ideas because they are at the end of the day kind of making decisions for the game that they're trying to craft for the player. And on your point of, is the designer's, can you repeat the first part oh, of the like, question? Like, can a great designer make a good game out of a bad, or like, you know, quotation marks, bad idea? That See, can work, yeah. I think this goes back to the subjectivity of like, what makes a game fun, you know? It depends entirely on the game. If I told you I'm gonna make a game where the player going to struggle real hard, and he's going to lose over and over and over, and eventually he'll win. You'd think that's probably a bad idea, but Dark Souls pulls it off, right? Like, it's all about the context of the game, it's all about building around that idea, what, how it interacts with your other mechanics. If, if that was your design philosophy for Breath of the Wild, it might be a little bit trickier to pull it off. Right, because Breath of the Wild's pillars are more centered around the world exploration, um, and not so much about you know extreme challenges. I think the most challenging parts of that game are like the puzzles, to be honest. Um, so yeah, it it goes back to kind of what is the vision of your game. Furthermore, there are games that like I would say are fairly simple to design and don't really do anything that I find very interesting, like design-wise. Basically, all it is is you're just walking or inside of a building, like Stanley's Parable. You don't really do much design-wise. There's like one or two puzzles, but even those are fairly simplistic. But the game, I find it incredibly enjoyable because it has this incredible writing and this very interesting world that you're exploring and like how games work as a whole. So like, a game is built of a lot of different things, and even though design is usually like one of the center pillars, it's not necessarily have to be one of the center pillars. You can have games that are like, okay, we're just going to take first person shooters, and we're not going to design basically anything new. You're still going to have to do a bunch of stuff as a designer, but we're not going to do anything new, and we're going to change it in this slight way, not design wise, but just story wise. I mean, there is a lot of ways a game can be well designed. There are games out there, I just can't name them, of course, off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, you know those games that are, those shooters like Uncharted, that are like the same, like you could pick it up, it's the same control, same buttons. Like it's on the ground, shooter. Correct. Okay, yeah. Is there like a platform that designers use to just make their own games from that? So like some kind of standard like template almost? So a lot of those games, from what I know, are made, so like one company, makes a bunch of those games. So like uh, Call of Duty, there's a whole bunch of companies, or there's like three or four companies that just make Call of Duty games. They make other games as well, but mostly they just make uh, Call of Duty games. So they have their Call of Duty games, and then they're like, okay, we have most of the structure for a Call of Duty game already here, let's just change five things. It's a lot easier to make a sequel than to make a new game, because you have a lot of the groundwork. But I don't think there's like one place that every single person who's ever made a first person shooter just goes, okay, that's what we're using. There's like, oh, here's core ideas, but you still, even, so like Doom is kind of like the first first person shooter. In some ways, not many games have changed very much since Doom, but in a lot of ways, 
people are like grappling, hooking, and like flying all over the battlefield. Like, uh, what was that new first person shooter? The one with the giant mech? Titanfall? Titanfall. Like, Titanfall and Titanfall 2. That's like, oh, you're not really changing too much from the basic first person shooter idea, but in another way, you're completely different, and it's kind of revitalizing the genre and stuff like that. So, okay, so let me take it like a little bit more primitive. Let's say it's a swipe, swipe yeah. type game. Um, same mechanics, same everything. Is there some things that you can just build upon uh, that you don't have to start from scratch? Um, I mean, as designers, we kind of like, you know, we play games as well to help us. And sometimes we see stuff in other games that we like to implement in the games we design. So, you know, that kind of swipe type of game, there's a lot of different games that already use that mechanic. And we can kind of like pull some of those things and then maybe adapt them to create the game we're designing. Are you asking specifically, like, can you download something that you can build off of, or are you yes. just asking, okay. But, I, I see what you're saying, but that's, that was my original question. I feel um, like that would probably be a little bit more program perspective than design perspective. I mean, but there like, are plenty of YouTube tutorials. You can look up, how do I make a first-person shooter in Unity, and there will be free assets. A, a 15 video long series of step-by-step -step how to program. Um, here, you can download the projects. Google search away, you know. Yeah. Um, how much time do, do I have? Do we have time for me to go on a tangent? Um, that might be fine. I guess. For me to go on a tangent? I have a question about skills yeah. real quick. Do you mind if I ask about skills? Yeah. So you guys list like 20,000 skills. How do I get better at design? I want to um, get better then. My best answer? Yes, yeah. do it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> get on in the slot. But I mean, that would be my answer is just, you know, just do it. Just go into a game project and just try to be a designer. Because, um, you know, the first time you do it, you're probably going to like learn a lot, probably going to fail and succeed at certain things. And that's just, I, I feel like the best way to you know, evolve as a designer is to like, put yourself in a team and like see those situations where like you have a hard time like designing something and then like what you can learn. Fail faster. Fail faster. <laughs> I thought someone was oh. at the door. Case was pointing at the poster on the door. Fail faster. That's the club motto. Uh, <laughs> another useful tool that I like to, for learning how, not how to be a better designer, but learning how other people design, they're like GDC. Um, What's that? Game design you? conference. If you just Google GDC, uh, there's a lot of specific ones. Some of them are like on art, some of them are other stuff. But uh, you I can did find presentation? Part yeah. of these presentations? Or yeah, oh. they are. Uh, presentation uh, they're, they're, they're made by. Uh, yeah. It's like every year they have like a GDC conference. And then they yes. Have, yeah, and then there's like presentations. Oh, and they teach a lot of stuff. Oh, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Is there like an academic one that you recommend? Oh, wow. Um, okay. Not off the top of my head. No. So there's presentations about design? Yeah. Which uh, design uh, one? Oh, there might be some. Like, I understand what you're saying, but like to me, that sounds like I'm gonna have like, for example, I'm making like a 
I don't know, League of Legends or World of Warcraft and I have like a skill. How do I go from, oh, this is gonna hit 20 damage. Okay, now let's try 25. Like, how do you, do you have any advices on, because I feel like that's gonna happen to me, like when I'm playing a game and I don't know, should I be doubling the number? Should I keep going down? What should I, what should I do? This, this answer, has, this question has a lot of answers. Uh, like number so number crunching is tough. You probably have more trouble. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess, like, the, the answer I can give you for now, since this is like a sum, quick summary of like a playtesting workshop, would be like to just, you can change the numbers on the fly. Like, just set a number. It could be a pretty high number and you can tone it down, or vice versa. Usually, people like doing the high number to tone down number. Um, and you can just change the numbers in game because depending on the way you're playtesting this, it could either be like a cheap prototype on like an engine or a table comp, like pen and paper, like you set it up and you're just testing this one thing. Like either way you can, like if you, you're, you're most likely able to just change the numbers on the fly if you feel something's too broken or too weak. Um, so yeah, that answers your question. That's perfect. And I think it's important to note if you're if you're testing your game on someone, they will rarely ever say to you, "This bullet deals too, like it deals five too much damage, <laughs> and you should you should tone it down just a little, just by five. You know, they're not going to say that. You have to pick a number, watch them play, see how quickly they're dealing with enemies, see how powerful that ability is, and if it's as powerful as you want it, great. If it's too powerful or less powerful, then change it up." But it, it's entirely dependent on like how how strong do you want the stability to be? What dials would you prefer to turn? If you want it to be like big damage, you know, maybe increase the cooldown a little bit. Um, there are other factors that can affect how powerful an ability is or how weak. An additional thing to think, of, think about is like when you're when you're doing something like this, you always want to make sure that um, that what you're doing um, that the ability is worth the cost. Uh, especially because sometimes there are just other abilities that you can get more for less, uh, like higher DPS, um, more interesting mechanics, stuff like that. So you will be aware of those factors when you are trying to do balance. And I think you kind of remind me of something. Um, I don't remember where I read it, but the, the it's important to always remember your player will have will choose to have less fun if it means that the numbers work out better. They will make choices at the sacrifice of fun gameplay for the sake of being able to clear levels faster, or they will grind one level over and over, even though it's no longer fun, just to get a specific piece of gear, right? Um, in, in games that are about you know number balancing, uh, like a, a shooter looter or a Players will tend to look for the most efficient way of doing something, disregarding whether or not it's actually fun. I think of WoW Classic, which recently released, right? The first person to hit level 60 played a uh, played a mage and just AoE farm. They just used area of effect abilities on the same group of enemies for hours on end. That's not fun. But they did it because they because it worked. It was the fastest way to get to sixty, you know. But yeah. So with regards to that, it's important to incentivize fun, engaging gameplay, um, and that's really like philosophical, like abstract kind of general ideas. But I think that's. Uh, bringing that down to like a little bit more of a concrete idea is if you're if you've got a attack that does 25 damage and you're worried that this attack should do 30 damage or 20 damage and the players playing the game and they're having fun with it at 25 damage and they're having fun with it at 30 damage and they're having fun with it at 20 damage and the different rating of the actual damage doesn't really affect how much fun the player is having with the game it might not matter exactly what the damage is there might be other things that they're enjoying. The damage is just, it's, you don't have to get it just perfect. This is the just right amount of damage. You just have to get close enough where it's not a tedious 
or it's not a impossible experience. So yeah, the summary of this slide is just basically plain testing and paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if you want to know more about play testing and how we can solve it or more philosophical ideas on it, you will have a workshop later in the quarter that we can spend the hour on just play testing. So we'll move on. Yeah, I, I, the designers. What tools? What tools do we use? Well, <laughs> paper and pencil. There you go. Yeah, pen, and pen, pen and paper, uh, an engine, spreadsheets, possibly. Um, a lot of us use Google Docs to make our game design documents. Um, and to show it to people as well. Yeah. Car cards are always fun. Cards and card sleeves, taping and stuff to cards in order to get Stop. some. If you're making a board game, if you're making a board game, having like bits and bobs to play around with is also really useful. Having a poker set, I've, um, in my experience, helps a lot because chip, poker chips make really good board pieces. We have a poker set at the back of the project. Is that the side? Side? Uh, it's in the fight. Yeah, from the other one. We'll probably bring that back in here at some point. Uh, yeah, so a lot of our tools, both physically and digitally, um, we have them just to help us, of course, play test, and um, as well as document changes that we make for our team because we want to make sure everyone's on the same page in a project. Uh, an important thing to note is that if you're making a prototype for a game, it doesn't have to be detailed. You can you can you, you can use literally anything that one gets the job done. Yeah, and you don't need to test the entire game at once. You can just test put a player in this one room and yeah. test that room. Test you, know, you don't need to test the entire game to see if the entire game is good. You can do it incrementally. You can have a single button and then just have the player go back and then figure out how they feel about clicking that one button. And that would be a viable play test. Yeah, there's actually an interesting TED talk about like a Google like designer who like talks about how he quickly prototype like really big Google projects. Like I think one of them was like a slideshow where you can use your hands to move the slides and literally how he did it was just tying string to chopsticks and like putting them behind a little projector or something. Every time you pull on a chopstick, it would like move the slide left and right. So like there, there is a lot of ways you can prototype something that sounds like completely big for something that's really simple. So yeah, uh, just a lot of physical tools, just anything to help us get the job done as well. Any other quick thoughts? So you've been sitting with us for about 50 minutes. Um, and uh, maybe you want to become a game designer now. Um, so how do you get started? Well, um, I mean, like I said before, you just do it. You just, do, like, we have, I mean, this is a workshop before the BGDC meeting tonight. You're going to be hearing a lot of pitches, and some of them might be looking for game design. And, you know, it would be cool if you just join on a project. Maybe it's a project that doesn't require experience, so it's like a perfect place to just, you know, fail faster and learn about like how you become a better designer? Um, in the industry, in every industry, there's something called the imposter syndrome, where you think <laughs> you're not qualified, where you think you're not good enough. Every, even the most qualified people think that. Um, if you stick around in the club long enough, we'll have industry professionals uh, come and give talks and you can talk face to face with people who make games for a living and they will tell you that they have doubt and that they are not sure if you know they're qualified for the position they're in or if they are really that good of a game designer or whatever their role is. Um, don't think that because you're inexperienced that that means that you can't join a game team. Remember that slide when we talked about like what skills you need to be a designer? Those aren't prerequisites. Those are just things you should know. But uh, if, even if you're someone who doesn't have any of the skills uh, we talked about in that slide, you can still be a game designer. Most of those skills that we talk about, uh, talked about in those in that slide, are stuff that you learn from experience. And the best way to get experience is to just do it. I am definitely not proficient with most of those skills. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure a lot of us can say the same. <laughs> but I would highly suggest uh, joining a scaffold project. That's the 
first thing I joined the Scrapple project first, but it's got a whole bunch of programming and stuff already down there in place, and so you can just design it on top of it. And I think uh, the Scrapple projects are like a top-down one um, and a platformer, both 2D. Yeah. And a video game, maybe you're like on a game project, and you know maybe you want to practice your design further. You can always try and design like a tabletop game, a card game, or board game. Something that you can like rapidly prototype and practice play testing since um, you know programming on an engine might be harder to get as many play tests in just because you're reliant on like making sure the code works. But you know sometimes you can just whip out some pen and paper and make your own game or try to simulate the game you're already designing and try to put it in pen and paper format so it's easy to play test. So also the fact that you're here is a good thing. Keep coming to these. We will keep giving you nuggets of information that we have learned from the people before us and that we have learned from experience. And hopefully that kind of gives you a general idea of how to be a designer. Uh, we're okay designers. I like to think so. So. I worship should be like this, so who I worship? Like, what are the worship going to be like? What is the common structure? Oh. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> <This one? laughs> Order. Um, these are just a couple of things we'll be touching on. Uh, next week will be game design documents because now that by that point you'll probably be in a team and it's important to know how to make sure everything you design and talk to your team is documented. Um, there's some other workshops that we have uh, planned for the quarter as well as um, having some of us play some games and talk about the design within them. Uh, so those are our plans for some of the workshops uh, throughout this quarter. Yeah, most, most of them will be kind of us talking and then some discussion. That seems to be a pretty common format. Um, there might be occasional activities uh, we've done in the past. So on game design documents, I'm kind of leaving that next week. And I'm pretty sure we'll have like an explanation of design documents. And then about halfway through it, uh, or a quarter of the way through it, or however long it takes, uh, I will put up like Here's a game idea. Here's a bunch of ideas that your people in your group had, and let's try to write a design document off of these ideas. Type situation. I haven't written that down yet. I might forget in five minutes, in which case we won't do that. But that's kind of the idea that I was parsing together. You have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, I want to be a uh, designer on the team, but I have zero experience. I don't want to put my team at a disadvantage. Uh, should I just sit this one out? Oh, uh, no, definitely not. Um, so yeah, we mentioned scaffold projects in the beginning. Um, these are projects where it's like a, it's like a very beginner project. Like, this is designed for people to go on if they have zero experience. You were asking earlier about where I could find, like, for example, like if you could find online like, uh, like a game, like a first person shooter. Something to start with so I can just build. Scaffold, that's what a scaffold is. Scaffold is exactly. um, We have two scaffolds. As to be platformer, to be platformer. So let's say, for instance, you're on a scaffold project, the, the platforming one. What you'll be given is you have the Unity engine, and you'll have a character with a basic movement script with WASD, some ground, and I think, is that right? Is that well, the pitches, after the pitches, uh, we're going to show them the actual yeah. game. So we're going to put it up, and if you go to the meeting, we're going to actually show what is inside of each project. So you have a good idea of what it is. So, so, bas so basically, oh, sorry. Um, so basically, once you have the scaffold, you already have a game. It's literally a character moving on a screen. Technically speaking, you could have been done at that point, but as a designer, you can add on to it. So like you can create a more intricate level, you can add enemies, you can make the camera change, you can add particles, all that stuff. And this is basically a safe place for you to just try stuff out because even if it doesn't work, you already have a game. So very relatively few games that will be pitched are intended to be, you know, portfolio pieces. Um, and they'll tell you if they are. If it's not a portfolio piece, it's totally fair game. Um, that means that the team lead obviously like would, would like the game to work out, but it's not crucial to them getting into the games industry. You know, that's what like there's kind of a distinction between um, like experience kind of pieces and then portfolio pieces. Um, scaffolds are very much on the lowest end of like people, it's not that they don't take it seriously, obviously we take it seriously, but
but it's more to be entry level and it's not going to be a polished AAA game. It's going to be a the learning course, experience. Yes, it, the purpose of those is to fail faster so that everyone on the team, regardless of role, um, learns both how to work in a team, uh, specifically within a club, how their role functions within a team, um, and then just generally what what game development means, like how, how, how do you do that well. Yeah. Is signing up for the scaffold project the same process as the regular? Project? Yeah. Um, we'll go over, if you go tonight, we'll go over and explain all of that tonight at 8, I think. Um, but basically, it's like a scroll down list, and it'll be all the different project names, and then it'll scaffold. be scaffold. Okay. Uh, but like my first project was a scaffold, and I think it's a really good experience. But we have a lot of programmers in our uh, club, and so there's a whole bunch of people who are fairly good at programming. And so just having someone on the team, even if they're not incredibly experienced, who's thinking about, okay, how do we want this game to be designed, is has a, an incredible boost compared to not having someone who's doing that. Yeah, you, you had mentioned, am I going to put my team at a disadvantage? I would say quite the opposite, like he's just saying. Um, there are, unfortunately, a lot of scaffold teams that end up being majority programmers, because that's just what, that's the makeup of our club. Yeah. It's like a, of the school. Um, and so having, like you said, someone dedicated to design and someone who's coming to these workshops and can kind of, yeah. you know, is thinking about specific ways to make things better um, is a great improvement. And is it over the course of the quarter, the project? It's over yes. the course of the quarter. Yeah. As well as these workshops. So, you know, you can kind of do both. Mm -hmm. I, would we, I would also highly suggest if you want to like focus on learning how to design or learning how to do any other aspect. Try not to be the team lead. We want team leads, and it's a really good idea to have team leads, but I was a team lead on my first uh, one, and I basically just team led. I basically did production. So if you're interested in production, be team lead. And like, yes, please be team leads, but if you're like, I really want to practice at design, it might not be. You being a team lead will take up a lot of your time. So that's, that's you know, we finished just about in time, but uh, we still got two more minutes. So if anyone has any like last minute questions, yes. So here when we play a game, we take a game as a game. So, uh, but we didn't like realize like the game is combined by different pieces of like you know the uh, which works by the game designer. So I just want like uh, I I would like I mean. I would like to see some example from like very good uh, game and about uh, like which part of the, their game design is good. I believe. I think. Do you guys have like this kind of workshop? Yes. I believe. So you mean like looking looking at a game and analyzing it? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, like, and like what? Well, which part of the game design is we good and why? We usually have two or three weeks in which we just have game uh, workshops, whereas we. We as the designers, we design officers will pick a game, each one of us will pick like a game that we like, we enjoy, and explain why we like this game, what we think we did well, what uh, what we improve, stuff like that. Yeah, so like these are kind of like workshops within the first six weeks of the quarter, but um, for the last three weeks we have this little thing called Game of the Week, where we have like one of us hop on this computer and play a game, and we can like discuss it, like have people shout out what they feel about the game, and have um, the design officer at that time explain what aspects of the game is well designed or maybe not well designed, you know, not everything's perfect. And so those those might be the kind of workshops you want to look, look out for, like towards the end of the quarter. Um, we wanted to make the beginning more like, like things that every designer should know and then once we get through all that, then we start going to like maybe delving into actual gameplay and like other games. Yeah, uh, so it's three o'clock, so you all are free to leave. Um, but if you have any more questions, uh, we'll still be around for a little bit.